Hypoxia affects the brain, but the way it affects the brain provides clues that are important in the primary assessment. Let's get right into it. Okay. And, and you know, through our discussions and, you know, and in our uh, presentations together and so forth, you know, I'm a firm believer, uh, like you, that pathophysiology is important to understand because it provides so many clues to the EMS practitioner, whether you're an EMR, an EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic, it provides a lot of clues. And a lot of times these are subtle clues um, that really will enhance your ability to assess the patient and also trending of the patient's uh, you know, condition, whether they're improving, deteriorating, or not. A lot of these little signs and symptoms are things that you have to pay attention to. I say a lot of times, you know, people will say like, well, I found uh, the skin's pale cold and clammy, and they document it, and it's like, oh, I got to remember to put that in my pre-hospital care report, but they really don't pay much attention to what it actually means about the patient. And so that's why I said, you know, understanding these little um, you know, little pearls of pathophysiology are really important. And so, you know, um, right, hypoxia affects the brain. We know that the brain tissue is the most sensitive to uh, any insults of hypoxia. And the hypoxia is coming from hypoxemia, which obviously hypoxemia is an inadequate amount of oxygen found in the blood, because the blood, we know, is the number one carrier of the uh, oxygen to the brain. So it's interesting, you know, and, you know, at times people say like, well, you know, uh, they weren't cyanotic. And I say, well, you know, when they, when the patient becomes cyanotic, you're so far behind the ball at that point that it's going to be real tough to, to recover. And so therefore you have to start looking for these very subtle signs and symptoms of hypoxia or hypoxemia. So we already know the brain is the most sensitive organ to hypoxia. And because of that, it is going to respond relatively quickly. It's, it's kind of like the heart. When the heart gets irritable, uh, you start having, you know, dysrhythmia as well. When the brain gets irritable because it's hypoxic, it starts sending out impulses, okay? And um, what happens is, so the brain gets hypoxic. And one of the centers in the brain that's extremely uh, sensitive to this hypoxia is the medulla. And we know that the medulla houses the respiratory center, the cardiac center, and the vasomotor center. And the cardiac center has both the cardio inhibitory and the cardio accelerator center. So when the brain starts getting hypoxic, what it does instantaneously, and this is within seconds, it's sensing this hypoxia, it triggers the medulla to start sending out impulses. It's almost like a distress signal that the brain needs more oxygen. And so its response by the medulla is to send out impulses from the cardio accelerator center, the vasomotor center, and the respiratory center. And so you start looking at this, so, 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 okay, so that's great. So clinically, though, when you apply it, what you start to look at is what are the responses from the medulla? Well, if the cardio accelerator center is stimulated, what you're going to see clinically is the patient starts to exhibit some tachycardia. Now, initially, the patient's resting heart rate might be 70. And you say, well, you know, what's normally heart rate? Well, a lot of patients don't know that. But if they do, or if you've had this patient before, you might say, or even just judging. So you have a uh, 32-year-old, you know, patient, and you say, well, I would speculate that their heart rate, probably resting heart rate, would be in the 70s. And now they're at 92. And so although 92 is not considered tachycardia for that patient, it is obviously, you know, a, a, a physiologic response, and their heart rate is higher. And so suddenly you start looking at these things. You start looking at this. So the cardio accelerator center um, triggers the heart. It actually sends impulses to the SA node to increase the speed of the heart rate. And then also what it does is it sends impulses to increase the force of conduction, okay, which again, we know that is inotropy. We know that the increasing the speed at which the heart is beating is the chronotropy, and then also the dromotropy. If you want to increase how fast the heart beats, you have to increase the speed at which the impulse gets through the conduction system. So we have an increase in inotropy, which is contractility, an increase in chronotropy, which is an increase in heart rate, and an increase in dromotropy, which is the speed through the conduction system. Now, this will make sense, you know, um, in, in a second here, is why, why the brain is doing this. There's a reason for it. And the other thing that gets stimulated is the vasomotor center. And the vasomotor center controls the vessel size. 
and it changes the resistance in the vessels, primarily in the arterioles, you know, in the distal end of the artery right before it uh, enters into the capillary, um, and in the small arteries. It's not the large arteries, but it's the arterioles and also the smaller arteries. And so what happens there is, well, the vasomotor center actually increases the systemic vascular resistance through vasoconstriction. And so clinically, you say, so what are we seeing there? Well, when you start vasoconstricting, the first, the first organ, obviously, that's going to be affected is going to be the skin. And so when you start squeezing that nice, warm red blood out of the skin, that skin starts becoming pale because the red blood's not out there. It starts becoming cool because the nice warm red blood's not out there and also you start uh starting uh, start to feel this um you know diaphoresis this this clamminess and and that actually is from um stimulation of the sweat glands okay by the nervous system and, and, and you know one has to wonder so why is the brain why is the medulla increasing the heart rate and trying to increase systemic vascular resistance when it's hypoxic. Well, the bottom line is this, the brain thinks if I can get more blood because blood carries oxygen, I'm going to get more oxygen. And so it, its intent is to increase the blood flow to the brain. And the only way to increase blood flow to the brain is to increase blood pressure. And so if we go back and we say, well, so what's the equation for blood pressure? Well, blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And we know that if we could increase cardiac output, we could increase blood pressure. If we increase blood pressure, we increase oxygenation of the brain, in theory. That's what the, that's what the body is hoping. And at the same time, we say, well, systemic vascular resistance is part of that equation, too. If we increase systemic vascular resistance through vasoconstriction, we can increase blood pressure. We increase blood pressure, we increase oxygenation of the brain. Again, this is the brain's theory. And so what does the body do? What does the medulla intend to do? It intends to increase cardiac output. Well, how do you increase cardiac output? Well, we know cardiac output is determined by heart rate and stroke volume. So if I can increase heart rate, I can increase cardiac output. If I increase cardiac output, I increase blood pressure and hopefully get more oxygen to the brain. Therefore, that's why the heart rate's increasing. The body's trying to increase the heart rate in an attempt to give more blood flow to the brain. So the stroke volume now, the only way to increase stroke volume is you got to put more volume, which in this patient, they don't have the ability to increase their volume. They have their normal volemic. They have a normal blood volume, um, unless it's a hypovolemic patient, but that's a whole different case. But one other way to increase stroke volume is to increase the force of contraction. So therefore, that's your inotropy. By increasing the force of contraction, you might be able to increase stroke volume. If you increase stroke volume, you increase cardiac output. You increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure, and hopefully get more blood to the brain. So clinically, right, I'm, going to you... You, I'm going to stop you for one second. Go ahead. I think that we've just had about seven or eight minutes of what some people are probably thinking is some heavy duty pathophysiology. But the truth is, this is stuff that should be taught in every EMT class, but it's not. This concept of understanding is something we lost with the EMTB curriculum and we're trying to bring back and that this stuff is so important. The concept of not memorizing signs and symptoms versus understanding what goes on is what we're getting here. So I just wanted just to stop and say, as you started this uh, section with, is that you need to understand and that this is the stuff that many people probably should have been taught in class. I would even venture to say there's some medics out there that never got this. So this is just really important stuff. And when we look at skin changes, color, temperature, and condition, we say, oh, it's, it's shock. But now we're saying even hypoxia can do that.